Hey guys welcome to my channel. I hope you're well. This is a story about what if Deku was Spider-Man part 5 so I hope you enjoy. The title of the fanfiction we will be listening to is My Hero Academia, Ultimate Spider-Man and it's by Half Quetzal Coatl Hunter on fanfiction.net. So please go check out the fanfiction and the author in the description and support them for making this great story. But anyways let's get to the story. A pair of buses had been parked outside of the school, Izuku and Shota Nirenjiki directing boys onto one bus while Kendo and Momo were directing the girls onto the other one. Vlad noticed that little Eri was remaining with Kyoka, Miss, do we need to have someone pick up the little girl? He asked just before the girl boarded the bus. Kyoka shook her head, she gets a little clingy because of how she was treated before Izuku found her, she told the teacher, so the principal gave us permission to let her tag along whenever she feels too insecure to be away from us. Aizawa frowned, I don't know about it this time, Jiro. He informed the girl, as I said, we will be performing rescue training for the rest of the day. Hisashi came up to the group then, it's not a problem, he said, smiling at the young pair, Nizu asked me to come along since one of the supporting teachers is unable to attend, so I can watch her when you and Izuku are busy. Kyoka giggled as she ascended the steps into the bus, hear that, squ squirt, you get to spend some time with grandpa. He heard Eri giggling happily while his two companions tried not to laugh. The man's brow twitched as Vlad hit a laugh behind a cough, ahem, well, if you're sure about this, then I won't raise a fuss, grand a clicking sound drew his attention to the man, who was pointing his left arm at him. My wrist gauntlets have a low-caliber gatling gun in them, he warned, care to test the accuracy? No need, Vlad said and stepped onto the bus. Though Hisashi could still hear him snickering away. The man rolled his eyes and engaged his mask again, this is gonna be a long day. He muttered to himself as he boarded the bus. Once on, he wished he'd boarded the other one. The girls were all chattering up a storm, most of them cooing over Eri, and making a fuss over the fact that Kyoka was wearing a ring. Seriously. This is just a promise ring. The girl tried to defend herself, but the fact that she was probably the only girl on the bus in a relationship made her almost as big a target as the little girl she was holding. One of the 1B girls, a pale girl named Reiko Yanagi, had a timid smile on her face, yeah, but that's still pretty special, she said, I mean, how many first-year guys would want to start a relationship, let alone a serious one, right off the bat? Mina giggled from her side of the bus, normally, I'd agree with you there, but our Midori is a pretty special kind of guy. She said, pointing toward the formerly invisible girl, check out Toru, for example. He made that cuff she's wearing that lets her use her quirk anytime she wants instead of having it on all the time. Toru blushed, yeah, I hadn't seen myself since I was four years old, she bashfully rubbed the back of her neck, but, when I found out about it, I was so excited about seeing what I looked like that I forgot that I was in the middle of our class and pretty much naked when I slapped it on. And my also oh innocent boyfriend, plus the entire class, nearly got an eyeful. Kyoka muttered, still stuck in the memory of catching sight of Toru's body right before Momo had covered her. her. Toru blushed as red as Kirishima's dyed hair, I already said I was sorry. She pouted, besides, you guys weren't official, yet. Momo looked at the girl, Toru, not to cast out, but that kiss should have made it obvious. You guys kissed on camera? Setsuna Tokage, another girl from class 1B, said right before her head floated off from her body. This creeped Kyoka out just a little, but she figured that it was some part of her quirk. Eri was not so lucky, and screamed so loudly at the sight of the girl's headless body that she nearly burst Kyoka's eardrums. Whoa, whoa, Eri, calm down. Kyoka yelped as the girl hid her face in the girl's jacket. It's okay. Look, she's fine. Setsuna, pull yourself back together, quick. Shiazaki Ibra shouted while the girl's head floated back into place, both hoping it would calm the crying child down. There, now, see? She was just playing around, weren't you, Setsuna? She said, trying to sound less frantic than she actually was. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally fine, Setsuna said for herself, my quirk just lets me separate my body into smaller parts. I'm not hurt at all. Hisashi came back to their row with a worried look on his face, what's going on? 
Kyoka, Eri's face still tucked into her shoulder with her patting the child's back soothingly, looked up at the worried man, she got freaked out by Tokage's quirk. She told him, an idea popping into her head, hey, how long is the bus ride gonna be? About an hour, give or take, Vlad King called back, and we're still not ready to leave, yet. He ended on a growl directed at his phone, Power Loader just sent me a text letting me know know that one of his students is going to be joining us to assess the first year's abilities to better make their equipment. So now we gotta wait on her. Setsuna was looking sick with worry, I am so sorry, she said as the little girl cried, I totally wasn't thinking that she'd get so scared that easily. What did you have in mind, Kyoka? Prowler asked as he opened up the faceplate on his visor. Kendo goggled at him, hey, whoa. You look just like my boyfriend? Kyoka grinned at her, yeah, this is his dad. Hisashi gave the girl a half-hearted salute. Kyoka then began patting Eri's hair, Eri, sweetie, it's okay, no one's gonna hurt you, or get hurt. Still hiding her face, Eri mumbled, but she came apart just like the others did when they were nice to me. No, no, it's okay, she soothed, they're not the ones that hurt you. Everyone's been nice, remember? Eri nodded. See? Kyoka told her as the little girl raised her head, there's no one in this school that's gonna hurt you, she told her while Eri looked around at the other girls. She then turned the girl around so she could cradle her comfortably. Cause you know that if someone even tried, either me, your daddy and your grandpa would beat them up, right? MMHM. The little girl mumbled. Setsuna got down in front of her, I'm really sorry for scaring you, sweetie. She told the little girl, if I'd know that I would, I wouldn't have done that. Kyoka smiled as the little girl still clutched at her, no longer crying. See? She's nice. She said as Setsuna took her seat back. Soon, Eri was calm again, the other students cautioned against using their quirks so they wouldn't scare her again. And just as Kyoka predicted, the little girl soon started dozing off. Someone's getting sleepy. She noted in a sing-song tone, and a moment later she did start singing. Hush now baby don't you cry, one, her voice got the attention of, of the other students, rest your wings my butterfly, Vlad looked over his shoulder away from his phone while Hisashi smiled and headed back to the front while Eri settled against her sleepily. Within seconds, she was sound asleep as Kyoka finished singing to her. All of the others were looking at her with starry eyes, oh my gosh. I didn't know you could sing like that. Ochako beamed quietly so that she wouldn't wake the little girl, that was amazing. Truly, you are blessed with a god-given gift, Shiyazaki said with her hands clasped together. Kendo giggled, great, this'll just give Monoma something else to complain about. Kyoka blushed as the others continued to lob compliments at the girl for her singing while Hisashi just chuckled from his place at the front of the bus, if that boy of mine screws things up with her, then I'm never gonna let him hear the end of it as long as I live. Vlad just snorted, if the kid's as smart as people are saying he is, then he might have a chance. He said as he looked out the window and saw a figure running toward the bus, ah, that must be our missing tagalong. He opened up the doors as the student reached them. What took you so long? Finishing up some last-minute adjustments, the girl said in an out-of-breath huff though she managed to sound annoyed at the teacher's question as she hefted a case which looked to contain a costume, is there a Toru Hagakure on the bus? Toru stood up when she heard her name, I'm back here, May. Oh, great. The Rosette smiled widely as she made her way back, I got you a new costume design since Midoriya helped me get a better idea of what your quirk does. Toru blinked her multicolored eyes in confusion, ah, he must not have told you. When you gave us some of your hair to fabricate something that'll work with your quirk, I asked him if he could have a look at the hair follicles under a microscope. Momo looked at her in interest, what did you find out? May looked at her, when we did some experiments with your hair, hair, we found that your quirk works on any part of your body, Momo, the girl said, then looked at the formerly invisible girl, she could basically produce anything from any part of her body, even her hair. She pointed at Toru, yours, on the other hand, had nothing to do with your quirk. So? Toru frowned, my quirk isn't that my body bends light? May shook her head, nope, sure didn't look like it, she said, Midoriya and I da. The girl yelped as the bus took off and the sudden movement unbalanced her, hey. 
A little warning would a been nice. She shouted at Vlad. You should have found a seat after jumping on this bandwagon. Hisashi shouted back with a boisterous tone. May huffed, see if I ever work on your equipment, she grumbled as she sat next to Tora with the case in her lap, so anyway, the two of us did a little research, and didn't find anything about your body that produces a quirk. The girl blinked, more confused than ever, I still don't get it. Momo smiled, she means that you can control your quirk with your mind. She beamed, before continuing in a hushed tone as Eri stirred, your invisibility is a psychic ability. Up at the front, Hisashi found himself listening to the conversation more thoroughly through his mask sensors. Toru couldn't believe what she was hearing, so I'm, psychic? Kendo leaned in, psychic abilities have a really broad range and variety, Toru. She said, for example, some can read minds and use telekinesis to move things from one spot to another, sometimes really big things, and some can see into the future on rare cases, but invisibility sometimes falls into the psychic category, too. The girl blinked several times more before she looked down at the power cuff on her wrist, so, I don't really need this anymore? That depends, Hisashi called back, gaining the student's attention, if your quirk's been active all this time, then you'll probably need to work on controlling it properly to make yourself visible all the time. May nodded in agreement, yeah, but that's why I made this new suit for you, she patted the case in her lap, just like Azuka's cuff baby, this new baby has a power dampening effect based on the same tech that shuts your quirk off with the press of a button. She passed it over to Toru who opened it, but when you turn it off to use your quirk, it'll turn invisible right along with you. Oh, that blue goes so great with your eyes, Toru, too, Mina smiled as Toru lifted the suit up by the shoulders, you look great in this, honey. Toru held the suit to her chest with a blush on her cheeks, thanks, Mina, she then turned her attention back to Mei, and thank you, too. You've given me a lot to think about. Hey, thank Midoriya, Mei said with a shrug. I just designed a costume, but he's the one that pointed out that your quirk was mental, not physical. Toru giggled, yeah, I'll ask Kyoka to give him a big old kiss for me. Her words had the desired effect as the girl blushed crimson, Toru. Izuku's ride on the boy's bus was not as calm as he had hoped it would be. Nido Manoma was continuous antagonizing the members of Class 1A and there was nothing anyone could do about it since he wasn't dumb enough to fall for Shinso's quirk again after already being hit with it. Then there was Tetsu Tetsu's attitude to deal with. He and Kirishima were two peas in a pod, but his superiority complex was almost as bad as Manoma's. The boy, boy just resigned himself to a noisy ride as he sat next to Ida and Kaminari, one of his infamous notebooks in hand as he jotted down notes on Class 1B students. Kaminari was peeking over his shoulder with interest, so, you're like, a quirk expert right? Hardly, Izuku commented as he snapped the book closed, I've just been interested in them since I was little, he said with a small smile, and since I was quirkless for a long time, I studied extra hard so I could take UA's test. Shinso looked at him from across the aisle, I keep forgetting that you were quirkless when you took the practical exam, he frowned, I know that my quirk isn't suitable for combat, but I gotta say that it takes guts for quirkless people to try something like that. Izuku nodded, I tried so hard to break those stupid robots that my hands bled, please don't tell Kyoka that. He added in plea to his friends, who chuckled. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hananuki shouted, you didn't have a quirk when you went through the practical exam? Kaminari gave the lipless teen a hard look, you gonna rag on him, too? He asked defensively, his hands sparking dangerously. Easy now. Izuku chuckled, honestly, I'm used to it. TCH, Bakugo scoffed, the only reason he's here now is because he got lucky. Izuku sat back with a sigh, I really can't argue with that, he frowned, I did get lucky. Damned right you did. The explosive blonde sneered, I worked my ass off to get here and you got the world's number one hero backing you just because you were used as a science experiment. He glared right at the green-haired arachnid, I was born great, but everything special about you came out of a bottle. Aizawa frowned at the boy's words. This is gonna be a pain to deal with, the underground hero thought, but Kugo's therapy doesn't seem to be doing anything for that damned complex of his. Shinso wasn't too thrilled about Bakugo dissing on one of the few friends he had in the class, you're just mad that we beat in our first battle trial, Bakugo, he grinned at him in a taunting manner, whether his powers came out of a bottle or not, not he's still a better hero candidate than you. 
Why you? Sit quietly for the rest of the bus ride. Shinso intoned, his quirk at full power. Bakugo's back stiffened, mouth clamped shut, and sat back against his seat, looking furious, but quiet. Kaminari snickered, dude, you are one ballsy son of a bitch, he grinned at Shinso, you know he's not gonna forget this, right? Shinso shrugged as he sat back and crossed his arms, I really can't bring myself to care too much, he sighed, that guy needs to get that chip off his shoulder before he turns into a villainized washout. Siro gave one of his wide grins, can't say I don't agree, but man is he gonna be pissed. He said as he saw smoke rising from Makugo's hands. Manomo was no longer interested in antagonizing the other class. What he was interested in was the green-haired teen he'd heard so much about in the halls of UA so, you got your powers through some kind of gene manipulation? He asked with a huge condescending smile on his face, you know that doing that sort of thing is illegal, don't you? All eyes turned on the blonde, either angered or interested in how his words would affect the mood of the usually warm-hearted teen. You're lucky it didn't outright kill you for that matter, because most quirkless that do go through such a thing never make it past five minutes of having it done to them. Instead of getting upset, as Manoma had desired, the boy just grinned, well, I will say that I was pretty bad off when it happened to me, he said with a bashful laugh. Kaminari looked at him in confusion. Shinso and Ida were waiting for him to explain, it was just after I met Eri, he went on, the man that was was chasing her had a gun on him and managed to get a shot off that hit me in the side. He pointed to his left side, before looking over at the still mind-controlled Bakugo, I actually have Bakugo to thank for getting her to safety so Kyoka could get me to the hospital. Surprisingly it was Koda that piped up next, why you mean that you really did get a safe shot? The timid giant asked. Yeah, he nodded, knowing that he told them all about the shooting, apparently the bullet destroyed my liver, and I would have died without help, he said, thinking back on it with a shiver, I don't know what the doctor was thinking, but he took a chance and experimented on me, and probably saved my life. And gave you an incredible mutation quirk, Ida said, you've certainly done nothing wrong in my eyes. The blue-haired speedster smiled at his class representative, and I'm quite certain that you never asked to be treated as a laboratory experiment. Shinso nodded, plus you took in a kid, the brainwasher said before giving Manoma a dirty look, anyone that thinks otherwise has to be an idiot. Kaminari nodded, anyway, back to me asking about you knowing a lot about quirks, he said, hoping to change the grim subject, I was wondering if you'd thought of my quirk. He looked down at his hands, electrical based quirks are pretty common, but mine comes with a huge drawback of shorting out my brain whenever I use too much power. He clenched his fists, it makes me a pretty easy target, and the last thing I want is for some villain to use me as a hostage, or for a comrade to have to pick up my slack. Izuku looked at him with great interest, I'll help out if I can, he grinned broadly, so let me ask, do you just let your power loose, or do you focus on forcing it out of your body? I just let it loose, Denki shrugged, the only thing I usually try to control is how much voltage I put out. He held up his right right hand, letting a few sparks rise up out of his skin, there's really no resistance when the electricity comes out, I just can't direct it. Izuku nodded, then try focusing on both the output, and how you release it, he said, like forming a ball of lightning, or even shooting a bolt out of your hand. Denki held his hands up, his lightning quickly conforming to his mental commands and condensing into a ball, I can do that easily, Denki nodded, shooting it is a different problem altogether, though. He said, making a throwing motion, if I try to throw it, it either reabsorbs into my body, or it rebounds and shocks me senseless. Might I interject? Ida asked. Izuko smiled at him and nodded, thank you. Now, Kaminari, perhaps firing the blast needs a mental trigger? The ball disappeared while Denki sat back and thought about it, you mean like pushing a button in my head? Or pulling a trigger, Shinso put in. Whenever I use my quirk on someone, I always imagine the person I'm using it on trapped in a steel cage. The electric blonde nodded in understanding, makes sense, I guess, he said, maybe I can try it later when we're working on our quirks. Shigaraki tapped his foot impatiently, are we ready, yet? Heavy footsteps answered him as a large metal appendage appeared near him, no need to worry, my boy, Dr. Garaki said as both black and white spiders stood at his sides. We're running right on schedule. The lumbering form of his giant arachnoid, number six, was right behind him, its six arms bound by a metallic rope attached to Garaki's extra appendages. 
Shigaraki smiled behind his severed hands, I'm so excited, he said, his red eyes practically glowing, I can hardly wait. A black portal appeared behind him, I have gathered all of those that wish to be a part of the assault. Kirojiri said. We are ready to move on your orders. The doctor gave a very sickeningly wide grin, well, then, we wouldn't want to keep all of those dear students waiting, would we? The bus buses arrived on schedule despite May being late, and the students were ushered out and into the changing rooms where their costumes awaited them. Once again, Izuka found himself being stared at by the 1B students because of his scars. Juzo wasn't as hesitant about them as the rest of them, however. Man, Midoriya, that's some serious scarring. He said as he dressed, don't mean to be rude, but damn, dude. Izuku took it all in stride, nah, this isn't nearly as bad as it was a few years ago, he said offhandedly, a lot of them have faded over time. Still, though, you gotta be pretty damn tough to take that sort of damage, Juzo said, nodding his head, respect. Izuku chuckled as he pulled his suit's top over his head, thanks, that actually means a lot. He said as he settled the green and purple top into place. Then pulled his gauntlets on. Honestly, it's thanks to these that I have such a high pain tolerance, he checked his case and started loading up his utility belt with mines, bombs, tracers, and plenty of his power cuffs. Then he made certain that his web shooters were fully loaded and that he had lots of extra web cartridges. Shota was looking at all the tech he was arming himself with, geez, you really come prepared, don't you? Kirishima just laughed, hell yeah, he does, he grinned, Midoriya always prepares for war when he faces something unknown. It's kinda his way of showing respect in combat, too. Kaminari said, he'll come at you with everything he has without hesitation. Shinso grinned at a sweating Monoma, you would have been better off antagonizing Bakugo. He said as Izuku pulled on his mask, the eyes lighting up their eerie green color. The sight was a was enough to unnerve the 1B students. He walked out alongside Bakugo, who growled at him and knocked shoulders with him. Watch it you damned nerd. You bumped into me, thunderbomb. Izuku snapped, his confidence boosted beneath his mask. It's plastique, you loser. I hope you're the recyclable kind. Quipped the arachnid. I said plastique not plastic dumbass. It's the same thing. The hell it is. Ida shook his head in exasperation. When will those two ever grow up? Probably when Bakugo starts taking ballet lessons. Sato said with a hooting laugh. Shoto looked at the large team, so that means never, right? Pretty much. You took too long, Aizawa said as the students filed into the building. Vlad stepped up next to him, you'll all need to work on getting changed faster from this point on, he said, one of the few things Aizawa and I can agree on is the fact that time is the most important thing to a hero. Surprisingly, along with the Prowler's attendance, there was one other hero. Oh my gosh, it's number 13. Ochako squealed in delight, much like Izuku would whenever he met, any hero, really. She's my absolute favorite hero. The spacesuit-clad hero chuckled, well, it looks like I have a fan. She laughed, welcome to the Unforeseen Situation Joint, or USJ for short. Ha, huh, just like Universal Studio Japan, was the collective thought running through the students' minds. Here you'll be exposed to situations caused by natural disasters such as floods, earthquakes, and fires to name a few, Vlad said, and you'll learn how to react properly in such situations that cause you to rescue any civilians that may be caught in the chaos that follows such events. Aizawa, Aizawa nodded, which means that you will not be using your quirks to fight, instead you will be learning how to use them to save the lives of those that have been trapped or injured by the situation. He looked at both Shota and Izuku, class reps, front and center. Izuku and Shota stepped forward. Vlad stepped up to Shota, you will divide the class into teams of two, how you divide them is up to your discretion, but there should be at least one student from each class on a team with each other. He said, looking to Izuku, and then your teams will be given assignments in the aforementioned areas to begin rescue training. Prowler was off to the side listening to the lesson plan, finding them practical, but something caught his attention down below. The overhead lights flashed, a visible arc of electricity running across the bulbs, blowing some of them out. Then a shadowy, veil of a sort began to appear, becoming large enough to pass a truck through it.
and then to the man's horror out walk several individuals. We have intruders. Prowler shouted, alerting the teachers and students, his voice furious. UA High was supposed to be a state-of-the-art hero school, and here he was staring down at well over 50 villains that he recognized from police billboard wanted posters that had snuck in, and there was no indication of the damned alarm going off. Aizawa, you have some explaining to do. He snapped at the underground hero, what the hell is wrong with your security system? He demanded as he readied himself for the ensuing fight, why haven't the alarms gone off? The scruffy teacher just frowned at the man's tone, Kaminari, try your radio. He shouted at the student. The blonde boy frowned, tapping his headset, shit, all I'm getting is static. He called back to the teacher, someone's blocking the signal. Izuku stepped toward Kyoka and Eri, dad? What's going on? He called out to the prowler. No, no one move a muscle. Aizawa shouted as he leapt halfway down the steps. These people are villains. Prowler shouted as he ran after the man with Vlad hot on his heels. As the group filed out of the portal, a young man with pale hair and hands covering his body stepped out, followed closely by. Dr. Tsubasa? Izuka shouted as the rotund man lumbered out of the portal on four mechanical tentacle-like appendages. His grin was wide enough to split his face as he spotted the young man while the shadowy portal shrank as the last of the group filed out, taking on a humanoid shape. Two yellow eyes opened in the black mist, hmm, eraser head, number 13, Vlad King, and the prowler, it said, it seems that the files that you procured were misleading. All might doesn't appear to be here. Subasa seemed amused at the absence, such a shame, the rotund doctor said as he fiddled with his mustache, I was rather looking forward to seeing how my boys would fare against such a foe. The one that was covered in severed hands grumbled, after all that trouble I went through to get that stupid folder, he sneered in a high, raspy voice that made Izuka's skin crawl, and I even went through the trouble of gathering so many friends to bring along with us. There, there, my boy, the doctor said as he looked up at the three guardians, we must look on the bright side, look at all these little toys we get to play with. His eyes drifted up towards, towards the students and those beady eyes landed right on Izuku, Kyoka, and little Eri. And it would seem that I get to see firsthand how my very first success performs in combat. The hand-covered villain nodded, and maybe All Might will come out if we kill a few of these kids, huh? Subasa grinned widely, living or dead, I can extract samples from these wonderful crops either way. He smiled up at the boy, I had so hoped to find you here today, Izuku. He tipped his hat toward the students, oh, do forgive our rudeness in interrupting your class, but as you have heard, All Might is the reason we are here. He said as three figures stepped around him followed by a hulking monster that resembled a bipedal spider. But, seeing as that the world's number one dunderhead hasn't arrived, yet, do please allow myself and my associates to entertain ourselves, by ripping each of you apart. Vlad sneered down at the group of villains, whatever's jamming the communications has gotta be the work of one of these bastards' quirks. He cracked his knuckles menacingly, all we have to do is take him out, and the cavalry'll be here in no time. He tilted his head to the side and popped his neck while Aizawa and Prowler readied themselves. Hisashi grinned beneath his mask, been a while since I was in a decent fight, let alone a big old brawl like this, he cocked his wrist-mounted gatling guns, what say we turn this into a good learning experience for the kids, shall we? I like the sound of that, Vlad said as he covered his knuckles and hardened, crystallized blood, number 13, you protect the students, we'll handle these delinquents. Aizawa's eyes glowed as he pulled his goggles down over his eyes, keep your guards up, they said they came here to kill All Might, Might, remember? The Prowler's eyes glowed dangerously, gotta get past us first. With that, Prowler leapt into the air, tucking his legs in and plummeted the rest of the way down the steps. The moment the Prowler leapt into the air the villains acted as one, those with shooting-type quirks moving up the front lines. The purple and green suit erupted, forming a holographic shield in front of him before the bullets could hit their mark. The shield slammed into the first villain as he landed on top of them, flipped up on his hands and spun around using his legs like a windmill to kick the other villains away from him. Vlad jumped in next as one of the villains was sent flying by Prowler, and smashed his hardened blood-covered fist into them. Save some for me. Snooze you lose, old-timer. Prowler shouted while Eraserhead jumped into the fray right behind him with his quirk flaring to life, 
his cloth whipping around and snaring the nearest villains to smash them either into the ground, each other, or surrounding structures. Dad, look out! Izuku suddenly shouted as a large four-armed villain came barreling at him. Hisashi just grinned under his mask and bent himself backwards to avoid the villain's fist, well, if it isn't old steel bulwark. He said laughingly while he caught one of the villain's arms and rammed his knee up into the elbow joint, the bone snapping with a sickening crunch. Bulwark howled as he held his injured appendage. I'd have stayed out of this if I were you, the prowler said jokingly while practically dancing around him, especially after we ran into each other last time. The villain glared at him, it won't be like the last time. Bulwark roared as he made a grab for the ex-vigilante with his remaining arms, this time I'll use that fancy helmet of yours for a tea kettle. Prowler chuckled, oh, I don't think so, he ducked under another swing, my kid and grandkid are watching, so I gotta make my myself look good. He took an round object from his belt, here, hold this. He tossed it at steel bulwark, the villain floundering to catch it before realizing that the object was flashing. He, fell for it again. He raised his shield just as the small bomb exploded with massive force. The villain was laid twitching on the ground, out cold. The doctor raised his brow at the brutal display in front of them, Hoomph, perhaps we should have called in some more powerful allies? He grumbled to himself with Tamira nodding right alongside him. Don't you just hate it when pros live up to all their hype? The young man sneered. Indeed, Tsubasa sighed, casting his gaze toward the misty villain, Kirojiri, my boy, I do believe it's time for phase two. He said, are the other forces in the areas as we discussed? The misty warp villain nodded, they are, sir. Shall I proceed? Please do, the man nodded before pointing to the little girl that the one he knew as Jiro was holding, and make sure to keep track of where you send that little girl. Remember that she is vital to my future endeavors. And make sure that you don't hurt her, Tamira added, if we're going to catch something so rare, then it's better to just use a cheat, and take it without damage. Subasa nodded in agreement, and remind the others of what will happen if any harm comes to her by their hands, he sneered as number six snarled at his side, the monster's mandibles dripping with acid. Understood. Aizawa was far too busy fighting to keep his eyes on all the villains at once, let alone the ones that seemed to be the most dangerous, even though he tried, he had to blink at one point. When he did, the villain with the warping quirk was gone. Number 13. Protect the students. He shouted up at her just as the black mist reappeared behind the classes. Izuku acted right away, defensive quirks to the front. He shouted, long-range offensive form a second line behind the first. Aijiro and Tetsu Tetsu were out in front right on command while Juzo and Tsuburaba made up a line behind them. Katsuki blasted himself out in front, you don't give me orders webhead. Bakugo. Aijiro shouted and ran after him with his quirk activated. Both of them slammed into the warp villain full force, man, can't you just give the guy a break for once? The full redhead shouted as Katuski just grinned. However, their efforts didn't seem to harm the villain, rather he seemed amused, your efforts are worthy of recognition, little ones, the misty villain intoned. However, I can't have you impeding the goals of my masters. The shadowy mist spread all around the combined classes, you will be spread across this facility so that our comrades can torture you all. So many things happened at once that Izuku would later have difficulty remembering just what exactly happened. He felt himself being pulled from the ground, despite his ability to stick to any surface. Kyoka screamed next to him as she was also pulled into the void and saw the little girl being lifted from her arms. Eri's scream could have brought down the entirety of Yue on them as she was taken from her mother's arms. Suddenly, there was Toru jumping up to curl around the little girl. Both disappeared in a matter of seconds. Izuku and Kyoka tried to reach for each other, but were drawn apart and pulled deep into the darkness. Toru tumbled out of the shadowy portal, her body curled around the little girl protectively. When they finally came to a stop, she felt something wrap around her. Toru, are you alright? She heard the familiar voice ask frantically. The gir girl opened her eyes and saw Kendo Itsuka looking down at them, Kendo? She asked dizzily, looking down at Eri for a moment, seeing that the girl was safe, frightened, but safe. Eri, sweetie, you okay? 
Eri gave a shakily little nod as her big red eyes began to water, are mommy and daddy okay? Kendo straightened and helped Toru to her feet, I haven't seen them, the ginger said as she looked back toward the entrance, about half of US got taken away by that shadow monster creep and spat out in different areas around the USJ, she frowned as she looked at the surrounding area, if I had to guess, then I'd say that this is the landslide zone on the eastern side. Toru scrunched her brow as she soothed the little girl in her arms, that means we're almost two miles away from the entrance, she grumbled, did anyone else get sent to this area besides us? Yeah, Kendo jerked her thumb over her shoulder, I helped Todoroki and Shiyazaki duke it out with some villains that said that they were looking for, well, her. She pointed to Eri. I figured that it couldn't be good if they wanted her out of all of us, so we split up and started looking for her. She grinned widely, lucky for us it looks like you had her taken care of. Toru frowned in confusion, no, we just fell out of that portal, she said, but you guys were already in a fight? Yeah, I figure it's because that mist creep was trying to figure out who to drop where, Kendo said as she crossed her arms, you took the longest because he was probably trying to get get Eri away from you, and ended up dropping you out at the last possible second. Eri sniffled as Toru rubbed her back, then it's a good thing Auntie Toru wouldn't let you go, huh, Eri? I want my mommy and daddy, the girl sniffled again. Toru smiled down at her, oh, don't you worry, sweetie, we'll get you back to them soon, she said and looked at Kendo, any idea where Midoriya or Jiro might be? Kendo shook her head, all I really know is that you two, Todoroki, Ibra and I are here, she pointed down at their feet, the mountain zone is just over there, she pointed toward the cliffy area to the south, and I've heard fighting over in that area, like a lot of fighting. She said, pretty sure I heard one of Jiro's sonic screams over there, a low-key one, but it was definitely one of hers and not a villain. Toru sighed in exasperation, if there's heavy fighting over there, then that's the last place I want to take Eri. She said as the little girl whimpered in her arms, what about the central plaza? She asked just as an explosion went off in that direction, gaining their attention as they saw what could possibly be Aizawa, Kan, and Midoriya's father fighting in the, th in the throng the villains, and dealing serious damage if the crater in the ground was of any significance. Never mind. She said with a large bead of sweat running down her head. What we need to do is, Kendo began just as another portal opened up in front of the three girls, get back. The ginger shouted as she stepped in front of the two of them, her big fist quirk activating as the sound of heavy, steps, came from the portal. Out came first one long mechanical tentacle-like appendage, followed quickly by another, well, now, said an elderly voice with a false tone of kindness, I didn't expect to find you so easily, my little darling. A man dressed in a lab coat stepped out of the portal, revealing four mechanical tentacles in total combined with his actual limbs. He tucked his arms behind his back as he set himself on the ground. And I see we have a few, HM, rather disappointing specimens, I must say. He said as he looked over at Kendo enlarged hands, and then at Toro herself. The tentacles rose up, each having three opposable claws at the end of each of them but I suppose beggars can't be choosers, we are on a bit of a tight schedule. The claws started rotating like saw blades, and I'm certain that samples from a partial enlargement quirk like yours will be quite useful, the grin he wore as he stared at the girls was sickening. Listen, buddy, I don't know what you're after, but Kendo started but yelped a moment later as one of the tentacles whipped toward her, causing her to just barely dive roll out of the way with Toru and Eri. Some of her orange hair drifted down to the ground. This will do quite nicely, the man said as one of his tentacles picked it up and placed it into a specimen bottle from his coat, coat while Kendo checked her head for injuries. But I rather thought that one of you had an invisibility quirk? He said, sounding as though he was talking more to himself than the students. Rather uncommon, it's something that I would have happily to add it to my lovely collection. Said invisible girl jumped visibly while the man's eyes zeroed in on the movement, ah, uh, so it's you, is it? He grinned impossible wide. Well, then this is just about perfect, isn't it? I can harvest three quirks with very little effort. Two of the tentacles near his shoulders rose up, sprouting long spikes from their center, however, I believe more than just hair samples will be required from you little rascals, he rose from the ground using two of the mechanical appendages as he approached, Kendo rising to her feet in a defensive position, blood, bone marrow, brain tissue, spinal fluids, he rambled gleefully while Toru paled, you won't mind, will you my dears? He asked, I promise you won't feel any pain, for very long. Eri screamed as the upper tentacles rocketed toward them. 
Toru reached for her belt, becoming invisible almost completely save for the little girl, Kendo. She rushed to her side, and pushed Eri into her arms, take her and run. But. The girl yelped as she was pushed out of harm's way when one of the appendages made a grab for the girl. Don't argue with me, just get her out of here. The invisible girl shouted. Kendo didn't attempt to argue again as she turned on her heel and ran toward where she'd left Todoroki and Ibra, intending to bring help. The man chuckled as he settled himself back on the ground, a very valiant effort, my dear, he said, but you don't believe you can actually oof. A sharp blow across his face staggered him as he heard the scampering of feet against the ground. He rubbed his jaw, right, then, no more talking. Two of the arms whipped around him, extending well beyond what the girl had figured. A small shriek left her as she ducked under one of the arms. My quirk may sacrifice physical strength for my longevity, but that doesn't mean I am weak, young lady. He cackled as the other mechanical appendages joined the fray, smashing the ground around him. Toru just barely managed to dodge before she ducked down low. She cocked her fist back, and just for a moment the girl became visible as a bright light focused on her fist before she delivered a left straight to the man's face. The impact of the attack sounded like the sharp crack of a whip as the man staggered back, his nose broken and bleeding. Toru was shocked by the sheer force that she had produced from the blow, but didn't dwell on it as she became invisible again, but not fast enough. The tentacles smashed into her back, knocking the breath out of her while they coiled around her. She gasped for breath as the appendage squeezed her tighter, her bones creaking in protest, your quirk, the man chuckled, is far more interesting than I thought, my dear. He began to cackle as he brought her in close, one tentacle rising up with needles coming from the claw. But I believe our little game ends here. Her heart was hammering into her aching ribs as the needles inched closer to her neck. Come on. Her mind screamed at her, this isn't how you die, girl. Do something. She strained against the metal, pushing with all her might to get some breathing room. What's this? The man asked in wonder as she felt some of the pressure ease off, my word. Aren't you a little marvel? He said with obvious glee. Ex exclamation point. A wordless gasp escaped her as she inhaled sharply, gulping down as much air as she could manage when she felt the arm loosen more. She looked up and saw that the needle had paused just centimeters from her neck. Then a warm trickling sensation started from her ears and her nose, resulting in a warm coppery taste entering her mouth. The man was laughing loudly now, it seems that this form of your quirk isn't without its risks, he said as her vision began to swim in blurred images, all the better for me, I'm afraid. The pressure returned, a truly valiant effort, I assure you, but all in vain, she felt the needle penetrate her neck, I will get what I want. Not while we're here. A rush of freezing cold air rushed by her as she felt herself freed from the pressure of the metal appendages, her body collapsing to the ground. She gasped and coughed as she tried to regain her breath. Something then coiled around her body and started dragging her away. I've got you, Toru. S.H. Shiyazaki? The girl mumbled, Eri? She's safe. That was Todoroki's voice, you did an incredible job, Hagakure. Her vision cleared as she saw the heterochromic boy standing in front of them with a giant ice wall between them and the mad doctor. She could see him just on the other side, twirling his mustache in thought as though he were picking out a tie to wear while those mechanical arms of his swayed, hmm, your endeavor's child, aren't you, boy? His voice held a hint of longing, any other day I think I would have tried to take you on and obtain a sample. Todoroki sneered at him, the left side of his face steaming as it melted the partial ice mask, feel free to try, old man. HMHMHM, the man chuckled, oh, how tempted I am to take you up on that challenge. The claws on the metal appendages fl flared open and emitted a loud, high-pitched sound. A moment later Todoroki's ice wall shattered raining pulverized ice down on them. Because, while I'll readily admit that you are indeed powerful, he chuckled at the boy's face, without the other half of your power. You. Are. Nothing. Come over here and say that, Shota's left arm suddenly started to flare up with small tufts of flames, I don't see you trying to put me on my back. 
As I said, any other day, my boy, he rose up and snapped his fingers, a signal which caused another portal to open up behind him, unfortunately we are quite strapped for time, he rambled as he stepped back, but at least I have a small consolation prize. He stepped through the gate, thank you very much for your time, Miss Hagakure. Toru shivered as he held up a small red vial. Blood, her blood. Anger bubbled up through her no, she reached out her hand. You can't have that. She ground out, her form wavering between visibility, I won't let you take it. A small bubble formed around the vial, startling the man as it floated away from his fingers, and flew across the space between them into her outstretched hand. The bubble then imploded in her hand, smashing the vial. A small, weak grin spread across her face. You lose. Perhaps, the man growled back angrily, but the day isn't over, yet, you foolish little girl, he stepped back into the portal, and by day's end, I will have what I desire, and the symbol of peace will weep over the corpses of your classmates. He grinned widely, and my master will have his day. He disappeared into the shadow. Toru tried to get to her feet with Shiazaki steadying her, where's Eri? She demanded, we we have to. Kendo took her to where she thinks Kyoka might be, Shiazaki said in an attempt to soothe her, but you're in no condition to follow. Todoroki nodded as he made his way over to them, she's right, he pointed at her, you're bleeding from your nose and ears pretty badly, and I don't know why but you're also flickering in and out of visibility. Whatever you did to take that vial away from him, Shiazaki said, it's still affecting your quirk, and not in a good way. Toru shook her head, I'm fine, she pushed away from her and staggered to her feet and pressed the dial on her belt to shut off her quirk, I just have to find Eri, and get her to Ugg. She stumbled, collapsing to her hands and knees. Haga cure. Toru. Todoroki and Shiazaki were at her shoulders immediately. The only place you're going right now is wherever we can get medical supplies. Todoroki with as somberly as he could manage. He's right, dear, Shiazaki said, you're of no use to anyone like this. She patted her on the back, you have to remember, that Villian was also interested in you, so giving him another chance that you would not be in your best interest. And you know that Kendo will keep Eri safe, Todoroki said, I've seen her fight, Hagakure, she's no slouch. Toru frowned, praying that they were right. Kendo kept her chin down with Eri's head tucked under it as she ran guilt causing a sick feeling in her stomach as the images of Toru facing down the maniacal tentacled villain flashed through her head. She'll be fine, she told herself, she's part of class 1A, the top class for first years, she'll be fine. She jumped down a small cliff that led straight into a forested area just beneath the mountain area. Big sister? Eri piped up as she kendo slowed to take a breath, are the bad people gonna get us? Kendo stopped in her tracks, huffing and puffing but she managed a small tired smile at the girl, not a chance, sweetie, she said to the little girl in her arms, your auntie Toru told me to get you to your parents, and that's where we're going. Okay, the little girl nodded. It took a smile and looked around the area, hoping to see one of her friends or at least another from class 1A that knew Eri well enough to put her at ease. However she had a theory that, that those that had gotten caught in that missed villain's attack had all been warped away to different disaster zones. And if there are villains in those areas just like the landslide zone, then they're all gonna have their hands full. She thought to herself. I think he ran over here. The ginger nearly yelped as she ducked into the bushes to hide. Eri knew well enough to clamp her hands over her mouth, her little eyes wide with fear. Itsuka dared to peek through the leaves just a little bit to see what was going on, and who was searching for them. Two large villains, one with horns like a goat, and another with a hulking figure with a gas mask strapped over his face, were looking around. I swear I saw that little blonde shit run this way, the goat man said with a grunt, damn it. All this time wasted on an annoying little piss ant. The gas mask villain gave his partner a look, I told you we should've stayed in the plaza, he grumbled, one little runt ain't gonna amount to much when the docks off Aaron a huge reward for that little girl with the white hair. Eri shivered, but remained quiet. Itsuka was holding her right arm behind her just in case she needed to use her quirk. No way was I staying near the prowler, the goat man said, you got any idea what that bastard's capable of? Nah, the gas mask villain said, never seen the guy. The goat man shook his head, he's a real piece of work, man, he said, doesn't even need his quirk to beat someone, 
but you make him mad enough, and that quirk of his is gonna come out. He's worse than Endeavor. Nah, no one's that bad, the gas mask villain said, Endeavor's not scared to kill, member? The goat man scoffed, neither is the prowler. He said as they moved off, we gotta take care, too, I heard that the prowler's kid is among these students. They continued talking as they moved away from the two hidden chil children, relief washing over the older girl. That was close. She sighed as Eri nodded in agreement. Come on, we should get moving. She said as she checked the surroundings again before coming out of hiding. The two villains were nowhere to be seen, prompting a sigh of relief from her as she came out of the bushes. Kendo. Itsuka jumped, nearly shrieking in fright while little Eri squeaked in alarm. She whipped around, one hand enlarging to swat whoever it was that had snuck up on them, only to find one of her classmates running up to her. Juzo. The lipless teen smiled at her, man, am I glad to see you. He ran up to them, it's getting crazy in here. There's villains all over the place. I know, the girl shrank her hand back down to normal size while Juzo looked down at the little girl in her arms. He blinked, ah, uh, hey, isn't that the kid that? She got separated when that missed villain teleported us, Itsuka explained as she rubbed the little girl's head comfortingly. She looked at Juzo, you're not alone, are you? Juzo nodded tiredly, sure am. When I got tossed out, I was thrown right into the thick of it. He shivered slightly, I barely made it out of there. Lucky for me they didn't know what I could do with my quirk, so they all ended up getting stuck while I made a run for it. It took a curse under her breath, okay, then we should get moving before those two that were looking for you come back, she said while looking up at the mountain area, did you notice any villains near the mountain zone? Juzo shook his head, I got spat out near the plaza, and that place was crawling with them, he shook his head with frown marrying his face, but the teachers are tearing it up over there. Midoriya's old man is a real piece of work, too. Grandpa? Eri perked up. Itsuka smiled at her, yeah, just like your mommy said, he's beating up all, all the bad guys that wanna hurt you. Juzo grinned and pumped his fist, heck yeah, he is. He said while looking up at the mountain zone, are you looking for Midoriya or Jiro? Both, she nodded, Toru said she heard one of Jiro's sonic screams coming from the mountains, so I figured that was the best place to start. Juzo nodded, I actually caught sight of Midoriya, she looked at him expectantly, but the boy pointed toward the shipwreck zone, he and a few others got dropped over there. Itsuka squinted a little and caught sight of a familiar purple figure, I see him, but there's no way I'm getting out there with Eri. She frowned and then the three of them were shocked to see Izuku sparking with a large amount of electricity. What's he what the hell is he doing? She shouted in horror as she watched Izuku dive over the side of the boat and straight into the water. The result was a massive surge of electricity racing across the water and the pain screams of the villains that were surrounding the ship. Juzo hissed, dumb, that is harsh. He said with sympathy, Midoriya must be pissed. He looked at the little girl, I know he and Jiro were holding on to Eri when that missed villain took all of us, so he must be pretty desperate to get her back. Daddy's scary when he's mad, Eri said, remembering when he had attacked Hisashi after he had shown up. Itsuka and Juzo just laughed, yeah, sweetie, he sure is, she said before moving toward the mountain. Come on, we need to get moving before someone spots us. I'm afraid that it's a little late for that. Itsuka felt every hair on the back of her neck stand on end as if someone was about to put a knife to her throat. Acting on pure instinct, and wrapping Eri securely in her arms before whipping around with a spin kick. She connected with a skinny body as the figure behind her was thrown back. Back. Juzo paled, hey, he was with the mist villain. The man was skinny, and dressed in black from head to toe, and covered in severed hands, geez, you hero brats are no joke, he grumbled as he picked himself up, good thing that neither am I. He grinned behind the hand on his face, and rushed forward. He's fast. It took a duct as the man reached out for her, causing him to miss and touch the tree behind her. Itsuka was then horrified to see the tree, after that single touch, turned gray and started falling away into dust. Oh my god. Juzo, don't let this guy touch you or you're dead. Itsuka shouted before turning tail to make a run for it, but the villain was already on her. 
Shigaraki grinned at her, you don't really think I'll let you get away, now, do you? He asked, but before he could touch her, Juzo's shoulder checked him into the bushes. Run! Juzo shouted as he rushed by, grabbing her hand as he did and pulled her along. Shigaraki came out of the bushes looking furious and slammed both hands onto the ground. It turned ashen gray beneath their feet. As it turned to dust, both lost their footing. When they stumbled into the disintegrated ground, Shigaraki was on them in seconds. Juzo touched the ground between them and turned it into thick deep mud, causing the crazed villain to sink as though he'd stepped into a pool, what the? Go! Juzo shouted as he helped Atsuka back to her feet. By now Eri was crying in fright, calling out for her parents while the two teens pelted away from the villain struggling out of the trap. When I get my hands on you brats. He snarled as he turned his trap into dust, you won't be dying quickly. Juzo, Juzo looked behind them as they ran toward the mountains, he's gaining on us. He shouted. Just keep running. Itsuka shouted, don't stop. Juzo bent low to touch and liquefy the ground once more in hopes of stalling him. But a quick glance over his shoulder showed him that the villain had jumped over the impromptu trap. I won't fall for the same trick twice. He gained ground on them with frightening speeds. You'll need to do better than that. He reached out, his fingers almost catching Itsuka's hair, right as something snagged his wrist. What an ock! He was yanked away from the teens and slammed into a tree. Itsuka and Juzo came to a halt, wondering briefly what had saved them. Out of the trees came an imposing figure of the arachnid-themed hero in training. His arms were sparking wildly with stored electricity. The emblem on his chest and back and the eyes of his mask were glowing brighter than sunlamps. The two of them weren't able to see his face, but it was easy to tell, Izuku Midoriya was angry. Daddy! The minute she saw him Eri tried to squirm out of Itsuka's grip to get to him, but the girl held onto her firmly. Stay there, Spider-Man's tone was low, and dangerous as the villain picked himself up off the ground with a groan. Daddy needs to work right now. Juzo stood up, better be careful, man, he warned him, this guy has some kind of disintegration quirk. He said, looking ready to fight with him. One touch turned a tree to dust. The arachnid nodded in acknowledgement of the boy's warning, dropping into a fighting stance. Get Eri out of here. He said this to Atsuka who nodded and made ready to leave, and Kendo? She turned back to him for the briefest of moments as he turned his head slightly and gave a slow nod, thank you. She smiled and turned to run leaving the area with the two boys staying behind. Spider-Man turned to the boy who was cracking his knuckles and popping his neck, you should go, too, too. He commented, this could get dangerous. Juzo just snorted behind his helmet, I don't like running from a fight on my best of days, he said while the villain got to his feet, besides, this guy's way too dangerous to take out on your own. Spider-Man took something from his belt and handed it to him. Use that on him if you get the chance. He told him while Mudman nodded, placing the item in his pocket before getting ready for the fight. Shigaraki growled as he stared down the two heroes, don't think this is going to save that little brat, he snarled, if I don't get her, one of Garaki's monsters will. Spider-Man's lens brightened, that just means we need to take care of you quickly. Juzo nodded. Then we can get rid of your boss. He laughed which proved to enrage the man. He lunged at them screaming, I am the boss. Spider-Man went into the branches while Mudman dodged into the bushes, touching the ground as he went. Shigaraki's feet became encased in the softened ground. Not this again. He thrust his hand into the ground turned it to dust with his quirk before pulling himself out of the hole, don't you have any other tricks? How about this? He turned around and was met with a fist, venom punch. Spider-Man's electrified fist slammed into his gut and sent him sprawling but not before he grasped one of the plats on the back of his arm. The armored plate fell away like ashes leaving a hole in his suit. You have absolutely no respect for other people's fashion. Like I care. Shigaraki was up and after him again, only for Juzo to pop out of the bushes and sock him in the jaw before hiding again. You bastards are really starting to piss me off. He shouted as he saw Spider-Man just standing in front of him with his arms crossed. 
he raised his left hand and gave a beckoning gesture. Shigaraki was only too happy to oblige. This time, though, Izuku made no move to avoid his touch. The crazed villain thought that he had the battle won when his fingers touched the spider emblem on his chest, but the arachnid hero still stood. What the hell? In answer, Spider-Man reached up and took hold of the villain's wrist, and crushed it with a sickening crunch. Shigaraki screamed as she pulled his arm back and cradled his limp wrist. What, what the hell did you do to me? Spider-Man chuckled and gestured to his other arm. Shigaraki looked at his good arm and noticed a band around it. That's a little capture weapon I invented, he said as Mudman came up behind him, his helmet lifted up to reveal his smiling face, when it's activated, it not only safely nullifies a person's quirk, but can only be deactivated by the person that put it on you. And that's yours truly, Mudman gave a mocking bow, he, so to put things in simplest terms, you're basically quirkless right now. He laughed as the villain tried to remove the band. Shigaraki was furious. He was visibly shaking as he reached up and started scratching his neck in agitation, you little brats. Wait until I get this thing off. You won't be laughing then. In answer, Spider-Man came forward and pushed him against the trunk of a tree before placing a web bomb against his chest, letting it explode and bind him to the trunk like a fly wrapped up in a spider web. I don't think you'll be getting this device off anytime soon, he promised the villain, and I'm going to make sure you spend the rest of your life in prison for threatening my daughter. The eyes of his mask glowed dangerously as he spoke. Shigaraki just sneered at him behind his severed hands, oh, I don't think I'll be going anywhere except home after today's done, you wall-crawling pest. He said as his eyes rose up over, over his head, setting spider sense off like a grenade, you really don't think I came to this area alone, do you? Spider-Man's eyes widened visibly as he sensed something large and dangerous coming up behind them. Right behind Mudman. Hananuki. He turned in time seemed to slow down as he bolted for his comrade. Behind him, a giant creature with a large head and multiple arms stood. Mudman was turning slowly to face the creature. But Spider-Man reached him first and pushed him out of the way just as the creature's claws came down and a spray of red littered the ground. Kyoka felt something in her chest tighten as she tied up the last of the villains that they had been fighting in their area. What was that? She wondered while looking over to Mei and Momo, hey, girls? She called out as Mei was coiling up a new length of rope that was coming from Momo's arm, I think we should start heading down. She said as she looked down at the plaza where she saw the teachers still fighting. I'm getting seriously worried about Eri and Izuku. Momo nodded as Kaminari came over, looking a little fried. I can't blame you, the girl said as she cut off the rope, we'll finish up here, but I'd rather you not go alone so please, just wait a little longer. She said as she handed one end of the rope off to the electrified teen while he started tying up one of the villains. Kyoka frowned, looking at the chaos that the facility had become. How the hell did this happen? She wondered aloud while the others finished up, not only did these villains plan this attack, but they knew enough to cut off the communications, she looked at the villain they had just finished with. He was the one that had been blocking any and all signals coming in or out of the USJ. At least now that we can send out distress signals now. She sighed, feeling her stomach clench as she thought about the horrible feeling of Eri being taken from her arms, and seeing Izuku being pulled into the shadows a moment later. I hope they're both okay. May came over to her, you doing okay, Jiro? She asked as the girl hefted the rifle she had had Momo make for her, I mean, you know that Muscles can take care of himself, right? And Ari's probably just fine. Hagakure was with her, after all. Kyoka nodded, I know, May, but, I got this really bad feeling, you know? She said, that little girl's gonna be terrified no matter who she's. Mommy. Kyoka stiffened. She turned around and looked down the mountain, Mommy. Itsuka Kendo was running toward her with Eri in her arms, safe and sound. Her legs moved with a mind of her own as the girl rushed toward them. Itsuka knelt and put Eri down so that she could meet her. And the little girl did. She ran as hard as her little legs could carry her and jumped into Kyoka arms. The little girl hugged her so tightly that she almost couldn't breathe, thank God you're okay. The worried mother cried. 
Auntie Toru and big sister Kendo saved me, the girl sniffled into her chest, and then daddy came and beat up the bad person that tried to hurt me. Kyoka sat back with a smile on her face, he did? Where is he? She looked behind her and Itsuka, but saw no sign of her boyfriend. Itsuka came up to her, smiling, he stayed behind to deal with the villain that came after us. She pointed down into the forested area, he and Hananuki should be okay if they work together. May heard that, and looked down toward the forest using her zoom quirk with hopes of catching a glimpse of them. I'm not seeing anyone in the forest, but that might just mean that they're under the trees. She said before looking toward the plaza. But the teachers look like they're just about through with the guys that attacked us earlier. There's just... Just that weird doctor guy and that missed villain. She frowned as she looked toward the exit, hey, it looks like someone got out. Momo clasped her hands together in delight, that means we're about to get some much needed reinforcements. Wonderful. Not so wonderful, May frowned as she focused in on the rest of the class, it looks like number 13 is down for the count. Her suits all messed up. She said as the others gathered around her, Momo dragging Kaminari with her. May swung the rifle around back to the central plaza, hold on. She frowned, that Hanzi guy just stumbled out of the forest with that huge monster they had with them. Itsuka looked at her in alarm, what? But he was alone. She shouted with worry. Not anymore, May muttered as she pulled the bolt back to load a shell, geez, that thing is huge. She used her quirk to enhance her vision more, hang on, it's carrying someone, shit. She shouldered the weapon looking furious. Kyoka looked at her, who is it? May bit her lip and shook her head, sorry, but it's got Midoriya. Kyoka paled considerably while Momo came forward with a pair of binoculars she pulled from her arm. She looked down at that plaza, oh dear, Izuku was being dragged by the neck in one of the creature's large claws. He looks as though he's been badly wounded. The punk rocker couldn't take it, I need to get down there. She made to hand Eri off to Itsuka, but the girl stopped her, Kendo, please. But the ginger just shook her head sadly, we can't rush in without a plan, she told her, Izuka's easily one of the strongest students in either of our classes, but that monster took him down. She looked down toward the plaza herself, wincing as she saw their friend thrown to the ground harshly in front of the other two villains that stood near the mist villain, and then there's those two. May brought the rifle back up, taking aim at the monster, at this range I'd only make that thing mad, she muttered before tossing the gun away and reaching into her pocket, Momo, I need a few things, she handed her a couple of wrapped bars, these are some really high fat protein bars, scarf those down, and I'll get you a list. Momo nodded and unwrapped one of the bars, you have a plan? Working on it, the rosette said as she took a pad and pencil from her back pocket, Kyoka knows this, but Izuku has a really bad weakness that pretty much makes him lose all of his powers. She said with a look toward the girl and child, he gave me the specs for his new suit, and pretty much begged for a way to filter it out if he ever came across it, and there's a very likely chance that he would. Kendo looked at her with confusion, and that helps us how? That monster down there is obviously a arachnid-based mutant, the same type as Izuku, she explained as she scribbled away, from what I know of his powers, they were created by that wacko down there. She made a wild gesture toward the doctor while he was kneeling next to their friend, and if that monster has anything to do with Izuku's powers, then I'm willing to bet my favorite toolbox that it shares that same weakness. She ripped off the paper she was scribbling on as Momo finished eating. All right, Momo, I need all of this. As much as you can give me in the form of gas grenades. Momo took the paper, scanning it with a look of surprise, ethyl chloride? Yeah, I know, but that is his weakness, May told her with a vigorous nod of her head, and make sure that the grenades have a really high concentration. We want to knock that big bastard out of the game before it can do any lasting damage. She turned to Kendo and Kyoka, alright, here's what I got. But that will be the end of this video. Thanks for watching this video. Hoped you enjoyed this story. If you did enjoy this story, please leave a like. And join the Discord down below for a cookie. And make sure to check out my Hero Academia, Ultimate Spider-Man and the author Half Quetzal Coatl Hunter on fanfiction.net. The link to the story is down below. So please go check them out and support them for making this great story. But that will be the end of this video. Goodbye.
Ko Show out.